Long before there were Roman legions, there were three essential elements to a pre-mission briefing. The enemy, the weather, and the terrain. It started to rain. At first, none of the small band of Maxi Sod Green Berets and their Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries stationed at FOB-1's vulnerable launch site thought much about it. But the rain didn't stop. It rained right through the tents. They put engineer stakes at the four corners of their cots and hung ponchos above them to stay dry. When this failed, they placed waterproof blankets over their poncho liners. When that failed, they were wet. Their cots and the wood ammo boxes that held their possessions sunk into the mud. They placed sea ration cans under them to prop them up. As each can disappeared into the mud, they would add another can. They joked that they could eat for years just by digging them up. Outside, the trenches and the bunkers the brew called home filled with water. Ever resourceful, they pried the locks off the steel connex containers, removed the camp supplies, and moved in. Typhoon Bess came ashore at Fubai during the first week of September 1968. It dumped almost 20 inches of rain on the northeast corner of South Vietnam over a three-day period. Much of the area between the coast and the low foothills was inundated with water. Bridges and roads were washed out, and at military facilities, bunkers collapsed. Luckily, none of the SOG units were trapped in the field. Combat operations had been temporarily suspended, not in anticipation of the storm, but by the disruption caused by the sapper attack on FOB-4 at Da Nang two weeks earlier. Mounting evidence that the attackers had had inside help was particularly troubling. At Mylock, the Seabees had just bulldozed the beginnings of a permanent triangle-shaped camp across the dirt airstrip. It all dissolved into a sea of mud. For two weeks after the typhoon passed through, low clouds would enter the valley from the east and get trapped by the mountains on the south and west, dumping rain on the camp day and night. You know, Charlie's sitting in his hooch nice and dry, laughing at us, LT. Sergeant Rogers observed sarcastically. Their platoon was hidden in the forest, watching a village less than two miles from Mylock. With an excess population of young females, it had long been suspected of being a North Vietnamese rest stop. The rice paddies were flooded, and the wide dike road entering the village was barely above water. The rain was steady, but not hard. Somebody has to keep tabs on the NVA, Dawson replied. Yeah, well, maybe somebody besides us could do it for a change. They watched nothing happen in the village for another half hour. How long you plan on keeping this up, LT? Why, you got something else to do? When they returned to the camp, Dawson sat on the ammo box next to his bunk and removed his socks. Big chunks of spongy white skin that used to be calluses fell off his feet. He powdered his feet and took a semi-dry pair of socks down from the clothesline he had rigged under the poncho above his cot and put them on. He shook pieces of skin out of his wet socks and hung them over the line, pretending they would dry. Then he put on his wet boots and sloshed through the mud to the mess tent. He ate with Rogers. When they finished, they got a couple of beers. The rain had stopped, so as was their habit, they went and sat in the camp's only vehicle, a black jeep. Getting weapons and ammunition was never a problem for Sog. It was said that each FOB drew as much ammo each month as a regular army division, but vehicles were always a problem. This particular jeep had been stolen by an industrious Sog sergeant from the PX parking lot in Da Nang, then taken to a Vietnamese body shop where the serial numbers were removed and it was painted black. From there it was loaded on a C-130 Blackbird flown to Quang Tri, and driven overland to Mylock. It was a perfect metaphor for SOG's whatever-it-takes method of operation. They sat on the soaked seats of the jeep, by now oblivious to being wet. It was starting to get dark. On the horizon to the north, they could just make out an occasional column of smoke. As usual, the NVA were shelling the Marines at Camp Carroll from across the DMZ. What do you say we check out the village to the east tomorrow night? 
With all the rain, the NBA are probably getting low on rice, Dawson asked. Let somebody else do it, LT. I'm starting to think you're afraid to sleep in the goddamn tent, for Christ's sake. Yeah, we'll look around. What do we got, two strands of barbed wire and a chunk of canvas between us and Charlie? The tents aren't even sandbagged. All he'd have to do is set up a couple of machine guns and B-40s and he could blow the shit out of the place before he can even get your pants on. I'll tell you, you should listen to the brew. Maybe die, maybe no die. No sweat, Rogers quoted. <laughs> yeah, they just say that shit to jerk us off. I'm a firm believer in don't be there when it happens. What'd you learn that in officer's candidate school, Rogers taught it? Nah, they taught us to assault into an ambush. You're shitting me. Nope, that's what we learned. Well, maybe if you come out of here in one piece, you can go back and teach them how not to walk into an ambush, LT. Yeah, I'll teach them to hire Relang. Like most brew, in camp, Relang was always smiling, easy to get along with, almost childlike. But in the field, as their point man, he was a hyper-vigilant, stone-cold killer. Dawson walked right behind him on operations. I don't know what you're ever going to do if he gets killed, LT. Oh, I already figured that out. If he gets killed, I'm going to move back and let you walk behind the new guy. They left. It stopped raining. They spent a couple days repairing the trenches and bunkers to get the brew out of the Connex containers and back on the line. Then they built a makeshift walkway out of wood pallets and sandbags that ran from the airstrip to the operations tent. The first helicopters in three weeks were on their way, with VIPs coming to check out the construction of their new camp. The brew were looking very professional, standing guard and cleaning their weapons. How'd you get the brew so straight, LT? I told Relang a general was coming, Dawson replied, as a pair of helicopters appeared out of the east, approached, landed on the runway, and shut down. Soldiers placed a sheet of plywood on the ground by the strut apparently walking in the mud, ended at the rank of captain. They started getting off. Dawson didn't recognize the first two. The third was the FOB commander, who turned and helped the last passenger onto the plywood. Dressed in a light purple aldi and a conical hat, the major's Vietnamese girlfriend appeared. You can't make this shit up, Dawson said quietly. He takes her everywhere. The brew stopped cleaning their weapons and started chattering. Shut up, Rogers hissed as the group made their way through the gate with an earshot. Mylock Boku mud, they clearly heard the woman complain. After they entered the operations tent, Relang said, No have, General. The woman's a general, Rogers joked. No, General, Relang shook his head. Boom, boom. Everybody laughed at that. Let's just hope the North Vietnamese don't give her a medal after the war, Rogers said, no longer joking. Mac V. Sog's operators had become suspicious of everyone since the insider attack on FOB4. You will find my book Dawson's War worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac V. Sog's various missions, Dawson's War is the story of five men, three Americans and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But Sog was so much more than gunfights. Sog was a brotherhood, and unless you experience the camaraderie we shared, you can't really know Sog. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends, and like we do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer Sog's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks.